here I am in two hats, uh, one as the head of a lab at Ben Gurion University and another as the CTO uh, of NeuroHelp, a startup company. Uh, what we see here in this clip is uh, an epileptic seizure. Um, a girl named Lauren started to suffer from seizures since, since she was around two and a half years old and she's treatment resistant so no medications helped her and despite surgeries and different treatments she, she suffers from seizures that also affected her develop, development and she has to wear a helmet because sometimes she just falls. How do we help uh, these patients? So one thing that we can do for them if they do not respond to medications is develop systems for seizure prediction and detection. So let me explain. There are around 1% of the world population, 65 million or more people uh, who suffer from epilepsy. Um, about 30% of them, uh, which is around 20 million in the world, do not respond to current treatments. And there are 5 million new patients every year who do not know yet what's their diagnosis and whether they will respond to medication. So all these, uh, they require some solutions because they suffer from these unpredictable seizures. Uh, it's a lot of anxiety, safety issues, and all that. So we are trying to develop a system for seizure detection, mainly detecting the seizures as they happen. That's the first thing that we have to do. But we also try to predict seizures in advance so the patients can go to a safe place and even take certain medications that can prevent the seizure. If you take them in advance in sort of a closed loop manner, but, but you cannot take them all the time, just when there's alert. So one approach is to use wearable EEG systems. There are other approaches, for example, using uh, more uh, peripheral sensors like smartwatches uh, and motion sensors, but um, they have other issues related to uh, you know, false alarm rate, and also they cannot detect uh, all kinds of, uh, of seizures. So we are trying a wearable uh, EEG device, and the basic product is, is a hardware system with a, which would be very small and elegant. We'll talk about that in a moment. Then we pre-process the, the EEG data. We have to remove artifacts. Subsequently, we, we extract features, measures of brain dynamics, and then we feed them into machine and deep learning algorithms. We also use tools of machine learning interpretability to uh, rank the features and understand the, in, in, in how, how much they are informative. And then we produce seizures alerts for either detection, there's a seizure now, or prediction, there's a seizure going to be in, in a while, where we aim to predict seizures one hour in advance, but I would not discuss this today. So a few words about the features. What does it mean, features? Uh, because <clears throat> in principle, we can use the raw EEG data. That's what you can do, for example, with deep learning, but then it requires large amounts of data. So we do that, of course, but it turns out that it's very good also to, to extract features that we know uh, that are very informative for many years of uh, brain sciences. So among them are the classical spectral features, features that characterize the power spectrum of the EEG signals. So we have multiple sig sensors, um, we can extract from each of them the power, the total power, the power in different frequency bands that we have names for, like delta, theta, alpha, beta, and other um, measures that characterize the whole shape of the power spectrum in, in terms of the frequency and the power, like things that like called spectral moment, edge frequency, entropy, and others. So we extract these measures. We extract even more, but I will discuss it later. And, but for the present work, which I want to show you, we focused on these uh, spectral features. And then for simplicity here, we, are, we, will, we, we fit them now to a single machine learning algorithm, which I'll mention in a moment. So what, what is the challenge? The thing is that we are, we're trying to come up with a solution, which is a hardware and a software. So of course, if we use many electrodes, Maybe the device will be very accurate, but it will be too cumbersome, patients will not like to comply with. If you use too few sensors, like for example, nowadays there are systems that look like earbuds, but they are essentially EEG sensors. So it's very simple, I say, okay, let's go for these earbuds. No one knows that you are wearing an EEG system, but maybe the accuracy of this device would be too low, uh, a high false alarm rate, and again, patients would not comply with. So. So how do we find the sweet spot between very, being very simple or have a cool design but not very accurate and the other extreme which no one 
would use such a system, although it's very good, but for daily life, if you want to go to the mall, it's a bit strange. Um, so we have to strike the balance between these two competing uh, aspects or priorities. One thing that we have to do before, before we start to explore that systematically is to um, define the measure of performance. What do we want to optimize in terms of the machine learning? What I'm going to show is how, how we define this and then how we can explore it systematically and uh, in terms of the configurations, the electrode configuration, and then find where we want to, to operate. So one, one approach is to use the arrow seeker, receiver operating characteristic. It's very classical. On the y-axis, you have the true positive rate here, the false positive rate, and the area under the curve here is kind of a general measure of how good you are, and then you can put your threshold at different uh, places. Have, for example, uh, high sensitivity and low, and, but also if you have high sensitivity, it means a low threshold, so you may also have a high false alarm rate. Uh, if you have low sensitivity, um, uh, you will have low false alarm rate as well, but you have to strike the balance. So it's good, but in imbalanced data set, it's, it's not very good. So when you take data from patients with epilepsy, you have large amount of, of EEG. In the moment I'll mention that we have around 25 hours, 25,000 hours of EEG. The number of seizures is around 1,200. So there are not so many, and seizures can last like half a minute or a few minutes. So the seizures are really rare. It's an imbalanced data. In these data sets, arrow seekers are not very informative. They may be too optimistic. And sometimes you, see, you think that you have a low false alarm rate and you have an, an, a high area under the curve, but uh, it's misleading. So we decided to focus on what's called a precision recall curve. It's another famous uh, curve in the field, probably many know. The recall is essentially the sensitivity, how many seizures we are alerted, so it's the same thing. You can think of it as the green, the true positive, divided by the total, the number of seizures. How many seizures do I detect? And I want it to be as high as possible. But then we also have the, the recall, which is, um, you can see is the amount of true positive of, out of all the positives that we generate. So we also want it to be um, high. But then um, high sensitivity, you pay a trade-off. And we decided to focus on numbers around 0.7. 70% sensitivity is kind of um, accepted in the field of epilepsy. And of course, you want higher. We try to, to be at 80, 85%, uh, and even more. But you have to balance with the false alarm rate. So, so this is our measure. It's the area under the curve, the PR curve, which is above 0.7. And then we try to optimize that. Now we have, um, so that's the measure. So now we have, a, a lot, we use this database where we have uh, 158 patients, uh, 24, 969 hours of CG and 1,215 uh, uh, seizures. It's clinical data. So we have 19 electrodes. We use one of them as, as a reference. So we have 18 electrodes that we can play with. And now we want to check all these combinations of electrodes to see how well we can do if we take just a subset of electrodes, just a particular configuration. So first what we did was scanning many combinations of each number of electrodes. So for 18 electrodes, we have just a single uh, combination. Uh, essentially, for 17, we already have multiple combinations, but not too many, but as you go towards the middle, like 10 electrodes, seven electrodes, you have many combinations, many possible combinations. Here we did not scan all of them, but we, we ran the machine and then algorithm on part of the data, namely on part of the subjects, and it's a cross-subject test. So we test it on, a, on subjects that the algorithm did not see at all. Not just data points, but complete subjects that the algorithm did not see. And then we quantify the performance. Each point here is one configuration. So these are all the configurations, for example, of, of 10 electrodes, 9, 10, et cetera. And it's an interesting curve. And we see that, of course, it falls down. So if you go to two or four electrodes, performance substantially drops. But it doesn't drop too much if you go along these lines. So <coughs> we decided to focus on eight electrodes. It's a tough decision. 
And because, of course, ideally, I would like to have four electrodes. It would make the device much simpler. But we decided to focus on eight electrodes and then explore it more systematically. So, so the next stage, um, we, we calculated. It's easy to see that there are 43,758 com possible configurations of eight electrodes chosen out of 18. So we just scanned all of them. It's, computationally, it's very intensive because for each of these uh, configurations that are, that are spent here, we take the database, we do 20 splits. So splits means that we train on 118 patients and we test on the rest of them. There are some criteria to balance the slip, the, those splits in terms of the types of patients. And then we run the machine learning algorithm um, <coughs> On, on these subjects, we test it on the rest of them, the test set. And then what we calculated is the performance, this measure of PL07, with respect to the, to the performance of the full set of 18 electrodes, what we could achieve with 18 electrodes. And this, so these are these numbers. And you can see that it sharply falls initially, then it falls like that, and that's the, the lowest performance, with, that's the worst subset of electrodes, of eight electrodes. But all of these are eight electrode subsets. So here you can see that the, so the black line marks the top 1,000 configurations. So the idea here is that we still leave a lot of freedom to the designers. We tell them, look, these are good configurations. These are configurations that, uh, that can achieve high performance. And you can play with them to, to find what would be the most ergonomic design, the one that would work well. And th this is how we worked. Um, and, and that allowed us, so, so, so this is like the median across all the 20 splits of this relative measure. And for example, we can see here some examples. Th this is a configuration that achieved 97% of the full system. Uh, in, in reality, the sensitivity would be around 80% or so. But relative to the full system, it's 97%. That's the worst one. And, uh, that's the, the median. So, so the take-home message is that we can do a systematic work. It's very computationally intensive, but we can use the machine learning for the design of a wearable system. Uh, and then we share this information with our uh, design company that we work, we're working with, and they can optimize the mechanical design to find the sweet spot between uh, what would be convenient for the patients but also uh, have high accuracy from the point of view of the machine learning. Um, in the rest of my talk, um, I want to emphasize the importance of, of features. I mentioned earlier these uh, spectral features that are very common and very useful, but it helps to add additional features. So we are using tools from nonlinear dynamics, from like chaos theory that was mentioned from, from physics, in particular from statistical mechanics, in particular from this field of critical phenomena or phase transitions. There are computational theories suggesting that it's good for the brain to operate at the verge of hallucinations or epileptic seizures. From a computational point of view, the recurrent networks of the brain amplify the incoming information but are not getting insane, do not suffer from um, runaway excitation of, of the neural activity or which could manifest as hallucinations or seizures. And there is a whole mathematical framework which I will not get to in this talk. It, it's a one hour talk. Uh, but essentially we can track cascades of activity, spatiotemporal cascades in the EEG, the electroencephalography. We can extract various measures uh, that characterize the intrinsic amplification of the system, the balance of excitation and inhibition, and essentially, we characterize in, in a novel way the underlying dynamics, which is really interesting. So already these measures are very informative, for example, to test the efficacy of medication, which is very important in epilepsy and in, in other neurological and psychiatric phenomena, because uh, such measure can see the effectiveness of uh, particular medications. So we believe that the brain is kind of near critical, at the border. Supercritical would mean too much excitation and activity tends to blow, blow up, and subcritical is what you often see in disorders of consciousness where the network connectivity is too low and activity tends to die out prematurely. 
So here are some of these measures which I will not get uh, into their meaning, but essentially, you, for example, sigma is like the R of the COVID. The R not the spreading coefficient of the COVID, just when it comes to spreading of activity in the brain. So each point here is a healthy subject, and the red points are patients with epilepsy. Not during a seizure, during some rest. These are MEG data, magnetoencephalography. We used to have such a machine at Bar Ilan University, now it does not exist anymore. But uh, we can see that there are already nice differences, clear differences between the patients and the controls, indicating that the patient's brain is kind of overexcitable, has too much excitation or amplification. Using other measures, we can in even see differences between. Um, I think uh, it's not the right graph. I think I put here another, another figure, but, but we can see differences between uh, periods which are one hour before a seizure and periods which are far away from a seizure. So we can see the differences in brain dynamics using these kind of measures. We can even see that uh, in some patients, the gain measure goes up like in the half hour before a seizure. It gradually goes up and we see how the gain of the brain, the excitation in the brain goes up and then a seizure starts. So we can actually observe the transition without any machine learning. And then we can fit this into machine learning algorithms to improve the accuracy. Eventually the algorithms identify some patterns in a very high dimensional field, but space, and it's very important which dimensions we put as inputs. So using these kind of measures, we can inform the algorithms and make them more uh, accurate so we found that these measures are also helpful in schizophrenia, in mild cognitive impairment, disorders of consciousness, uh, many other things. So I mentioned uh, epilepsy, where we want to have wearable EG systems that combine machine learning and how we can use machine learning to optimize the design. We're working on this in other uh, domains, which I will not get into, like brain-computer interfaces. Again, there are multiple types, but then we want to read out brain activity in real time, translate it into commands or read uh, and extract measures of cognitive workload, emotional measures that could also be used for remote neurology, uh, sleep and sleep deprivation. A lot of our work is dedicated to, to that. Anesthesia and disorders of consciousness. Again, we're trying, for example, to develop a wearable system for operation rooms that could monitor the patients during anesthesia and provide information to the anesthesiologist about the level of consciousness of the patient so that they they can know when you can start the surgery, when, when you can end it and wake up the patient in a more efficient manner than currently where they have only indirect measures. And also new wellness essentially for everyone. Because at the end of the day, young parents suffer from sleep deprivation and all this, so we all suffer from something and there are applications that can be helpful for us. So I think that's it. My basic take home message is uh, one that wearable EG systems can revolutionize how we monitor and how we diagnose uh, neurological and neuropsychiatric disorders. But uh, the design is very challenging because it's, it's not something that you would, you know, put immediately some kind of a headband or an EG system on your, on your head and go with that in the street, uh, on the street. So we're trying to optimize the design with respect to the machine learning, and I showed you how we can do a systematic analysis of that. And another message is that it's very important to combine the expertise, domain expertise of, the, in, in this case, that we have as neuroscientists and experts in nonlinear dynamics of the brain with the machine learning. So we can come up with measures that can better inform, I did not get into how it affects machine learning performance, but we're working on that. And at the end of the day, we are not sales persons of, uh, of any you know, of these features. You can always use methods of interpretability to rank the different features and see if some novel features that I, I come up with are informative, if they help the algorithm or not, and how, how they help. So it, it can always be quantified. And that's it. I want to, of course, thank the amazing team at, at NeuroHelp. Many of them are former students and, or brain scientists who have expertise in machine learning, uh, like uh, Hagar gelbart sagiv who led the, the work that I presented earlier with optimizing the sensor configuration. Thank the student in my computational psychiatry lab and funding sources that are relevant to the study I presented here. Thank you very much. Any question, please?
Yeah, because, I mean, that's, that's always the problem when you do things at the inter intersection of academia and industry. Some of it is part of the IP, so you're right. Uh, we are going for a relatively simple design. I can tell you that it's going to look like a headband, but then some of the things we had to keep for ourselves, because we actually we were very different from the rest of the from the other players in the field. We we'll go for a smaller number of electrodes and different designs. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah, I agree. It's it's always the problem. I would, I wish I could be like more more open on some of the things. Yeah, it's a trade-off. better at different placements? Yeah, it's a great question about personalizing. Uh, so we can personalize the hardware and we can personalize the software. And ideally, we would personalize both. Now, in terms of FDA, FDA prefers like a closed form design and software. That you lock it. You lock the design, you lock the, the algorithm, and that's it for all patients for all times. We know that even if, if we have the same hardware design, but we keep updating the algorithm for specific patients, as more and more seizures are collected, we can, we can do much better. So it's just a matter of how FDA deals with uh, these issues of regulation of artificial intelligence. It's a, it's a hot topic these days. So we found that we can reach a relatively high accuracy, high performance, even with an algorithm that is adapted to many types of epilepsy. And we try to cover all of them. With, the, with a single algorithm and with a single design. And that's why we had to pay a lot of attention to that. But yes, in the future, we might have multiple designs, maybe four or five designs adapted to different uh, major types of epilepsy. For example, if we focus on temporal lobe epilepsy, it's the most common type of focal epilepsy, like 70 to 80% of the patients. First, the algorithm it, it performs even much better. We, we get a very low false alarm rate, less than you know, 0.4 for per 24 hours. It's a very low false alarm rate. So we might you know, design algorithms and software for specific populations. It would be optimal. Just a trade-off with FDA and uh, CE approval, yeah. Going one step further from uh, the point you reached right now. Yeah. From a specific, okay. Thank you. Oh, is it not too loud? <laughs> um, specific lab information from uh, a specific group that you analyzed, for the, as much as I understood. Now, at the moment at which you get a final deliverable product, yeah, uh, it would reach uh, larger uh, quantity of uh, people, and you might be able to use it by telemetry to receive information and uh, use that information to uh, improve the final uh, the product in the future to <laughs> do totally um, recursive uh, work on right. it we, we we will have to do that all the time even before we get with our product to the market we will have to calibrate it at home on on patients at home where they use our own device not clinical data so it's it's circular we i mean it's chicken and egg because the, there are no home use data of epilepsy that you, one can train a machine learning algorithm. Right now you don't Right have. now. The moment so you have, have a come product up with on the market, you can use it. And then further improve it in the future. And once we have massive amounts of data, we might be able to do much better in terms of performance. That was the, the point. I, I totally agree. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs>